Hey friends, you're watching Brainstorm Makers. I'm Henry. And I'm Irene. And here comes the big question. Why would you leave one homestead and go to another one? Well, one reason is you changed your mind. You decided that this homesteading idea was not a good idea. Hmm. Or maybe you didn't change your mind, but you want to do something different than your property would not allow you to do. Or maybe you found out that the property that you have has some serious defects with what you're trying to do. Right. Or maybe you decided that the area you're in just doesn't suit you economically, socially, religiously, however you define your little sphere of existence. Or maybe you decide that civilization is going to impinge upon your homestead lifestyle. Yeah, we actually watched a couple of families that did that. They, uh, they realized that, because we've seen farms driven out of business because the city folks moved out and all of a sudden they didn't like the stink of that barn. I have, a, I have kind of an interesting attitude. I think it's interesting. I just say, you know what? The farm was there before you moved in, before you built a house. Suck it up, buttercup. Enjoy the pure country air. Yeah, that fresh country air. Mm -mm. If you buy a piece of property down the street from a dairy farm or down the street from a feedlot, or from a pig farm. Or from a pig farm. Or a turkey farm. Mm -hmm. Chicken farm. Pig farm is probably the worst. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are going to smell that farm at some times. Sometimes, and, and sometimes it's going to smell really bad. Right. Uh, one of the first things we did when we bought this property, as soon as we could afford it, and as soon as we could find somebody reliable to do it, was we fenced the property. We live in an open range area. And what we discovered was that, in this case, it's, it's cows in this area. There are other open range areas that are sheep or some other critters. Uh, and we figured out that we would have virtually no bugs around the property. We'd be working, we'd be, you know, digging trenches, we'd be doing this, we'd be doing... No bugs. A herd of cows would come through. Ooh, no. But besides smell, you know, you get something else really bad. Yeah, biting flies. And biting flies that really drew blood in a major way. Yeah, they took chunks out of you. So all of a sudden we would have these biting flies and the cows would wander on, but the, but the flies would stay for a couple of weeks. Well, because they found non-willing sources of food. Right. And so, and, and they were destructive. The cows were. The cows were unbelievably destructive. You know, they would step on, you could have one plant <laughs> We did have in one plant. A, you know, in a, in a thousand acres, and they'll step on it. You know, the minute we fenced this property, we saw wildflowers that we hadn't seen in years of living out here. Or ever. Or ever, you know. All of a sudden, they weren't being stamped to death. All of a sudden, they weren't being eaten. All of a sudden, they were growing healthy enough to be able to uh, produce flowers that would make you spot them. Now, you know, when... Whenever you have a farming environment that has the potential for residential development, mm -hmm. there's going to be a conflict. There's yes. going to be a conflict between the developers and the farmers. Mm -hmm. And if it's not between the developers and the farmers, it's going to be between the people who buy the houses and the farmers. I was down at the uh, social club a couple months ago, and somebody came in to, con to complain to our president that he had a neighbor who was running the generator at all hours of the day and night. I'm like, we have no authority to do anything. We're if, a social club. If, if, if you want to live in an environment that has rules about generators, move back to the city. Move back to the city. There are no noise ordinances out here. Could you get somebody in trouble out here for noise? No. Oh, uh, during certain times of the year. Oh? During uh, times of the year when it is not permitted to shoot off fireworks... Or, or have an open, or firearms, or have an open flame, or anything else, you could get those people busted for that infringement. Not for the fact that they woke you up at 2 o'clock in the morning because they were shooting off fireworks, but because they were shooting off fireworks illegally because there was a fire ban in place. Yeah. But if you, if you look at, <laughs> at 
at the conflicts that are going to happen with, with homesteaders and homesteading and their neighbors. A lot of the reasons for moving to a new homestead is a lot of times first time homesteaders don't have a concept of how much land it takes to have right. cattle, how much land it takes to have uh, a quasi self-sufficiency when it comes to feeding goats mm -hmm. and chickens mm -hmm. or ducks or anything else. And they learned that Yes, five acres is self sufficiency. Self sufficiency, which is a point, which is a book that I strongly recommend that you mm -hmm. go find a copy of. Yes, you can be quote self sufficient on five acres, but not, not really. Not in the United States. But not really, yeah. and not most places. It has to be a very uh, reasonable climate with good water supplies and stuff like that. So you can do that in parts of Ohio, maybe Pennsylvania, lots of parts of New England some parts down south, but you can't do it where you have extremes. Of any kind. Of any kind. Whether it's uh, extremes of, of snow or rain or lack thereof. Right. So, you know, the, when I was reading those books, I was living in Virginia in an area where five acres, you could be pretty darn self-sufficient. Now, you're not going to be completely self-sufficient because you still need sneakers and boots and cars <laughs> and all those other things, but you can you could really reduce your water, your bills on everything by doing manual labor. So a lot a lot of people will say they'll get a taste of of living. I'm not going to call it really a homestead life because what they're focusing on is mostly farming. Mhm. Mm Animal farming, plant farming, they're not looking at longer term things like tree farming right. or developing aquaculture or things that are not typically thought of. Right. But if you look at, at those kind of traditional agrarian approaches to life, you think, oh, I have 10 acres, I've got plenty. I, I can grow everything I need. Well, I was forget never as annoyed in my life as when our next door neighbors here, next door being a relative term, built a second story on the house. Because <laughs> now I can see the blasted thing. So think, I didn't want to see it. So if you, if you think about that, uh, that somebody who has 10 acres and they say, oh, I can grow everything. Mm -hmm. Well, forget sugar and forget coffee and tea and things like that. Just think about if you're going to grow corn and soybeans mm -hmm. and wheat. We watched somebody this morning that sat there and said, we worked for several months and it saved us probably $5. Now, my take on what they said was, no, you saved a lot more money than that because what you have is organic dent corn that's non-GMO that you know what happened to it the whole time and now you can produce organic they would call it corn flour we would call corn, it corn, corn meal, meal here um, you could even produce masa if you wanted to by soaking it in lime now that that's if you go to buy organic corn meal I have a container of it in there, and believe me, it was a heck of a lot more than five bucks for a lot less than what they had. Yeah, they had 30 pounds of dent corn that, okay, so they had to shell it by using their thumbs. I've done that before. Where's yeah, your thumbs so, out? So <laughs> we both have, and, yes. we've, and, and we've actually ground it up. When we had uh, ducks and a goat, we ground it up and... Didn't grind it fine. What we did is we, we cracked, yeah, cracked it with it, an yep. old meat grinder. Yep. No. It, it, we're just breaking the, the kernels up into small enough Because it's more efficient useful. that way. Otherwise, the, the husk can actually sort of stay there to the point where, the hull rather, can actually stay there to the point where the animals can't get the full. That's why you feed cracked corn. You don't feel whole, whole, whole corn. Because otherwise, it just comes right on through, and they don't get the nutrition out of it. Let's talk about people who decide to change because they decided this is not a lifestyle that they really appreciate. I totally understand. I mean, when we moved out here, I did not understand, and I don't think you did either, exactly the level of labor it was going to take. I certainly did not understand the electrical needs that we would have, and we're conservative in comparison to most people. We are not the kind of people who leave the lights on. Uh, we lived through a couple of energy crunches here with kids, and no one died. So <laughs> that means we knew how to say, turn the freaking lights off, and 
you know, I expect in the evening when I was a kid, there was one room that was lit in the house. It was the living room, and we were all in that living room, and the only time I wouldn't be in that living room in the evening is if I had an a assignment, a school assignment, that I was trying to finish up a report or something like that. Then I'd be up in my bedroom with the desk light on and maybe one other ambient light in the room, not 75 lights on in my room. Yeah, when it, when it comes to building a homestead, Irene's right that, that um, I had a pretty good idea of what was going to be required, but what I didn't appreciate was the degree of effort we were going to have to put into putting in irrigation and other utilities, because most of that ended up needing to be done by hand. Right. And that, I, I can tell you, that's a lot of work. I know that Irene, while I was gone, Irene finished up one trench for irrigation. That included a rock that was bigger, I couldn't lift it. It was too heavy. Bigger than her ability to roll it out of the trench. Right. I actually had to dig a ramp, which means a lot more digging, in order to be able to use a pry bar to roll this big rock out of the trench. And it was right where I needed to be. I mean, literally, I had brought the plumbing over, and I was... And there was that rock, and there was no way to move that plumbing in any far enough to the right or left to be able to get around it. So I had to dig a ramp so, so I could. Do it. All of this was solvable with heavy equipment of various sizes right. for trenching for the irrigation. If I'd been able to find, and this is a big thing, if mm -hmm. I'd been able to find a tow behind um, excavator, which mm -hmm. is just the back end of a backhoe and it has wheels on it and you can tow it where, where you need to put it and you run a, uh, an engine on it. Had I been able to find one of those when we were doing this work, a day or two mm -hmm. worth of Instead work. Instead of weeks. Of work from one of those pieces of equipment would have made all of this trenching be possible. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't available in our area at the time. In mm -hmm. fact, it still isn't available. In order to get that kind of equipment, you have to go to Phoenix or further because it's really not used here. Mm -mm. Now, you could get a small backhoe, but small backhoe was too big for the areas that we needed to trench for. And if you're getting a small irrigation. backhoe, that means you're not just paying the rental for the equipment. It has to be towed. Do you have a vehicle that can tow it? Or are you going to have to pay for delivery? You'll spend as much in delivery up here as you will in the equipment. Sometimes more. Sometimes yeah. more. Yeah. And we see that all the time. There's a piece of uh, BLM land where they drop stuff off and pick stuff up sometimes where the bus turns around and things like that. And, uh, yeah, you'll see pieces of equipment dropped off there and picked up there and stuff like that. And you, you're going, ow, that was an expensive drop-off. Let's talk briefly about changing your mind about the kind of homesteading that you're trying to do. We've watched one channel in Missouri for a number of years, mm -hmm. and they started off with a couple of feeder pigs, and then they ended up with one cow, and then they bought, they were fortunate to be able to buy another piece of land. Just down the street, and, literally. I mean, like less than, probably I think it's less than 20 minutes away. Uh, much less than that. Yeah. Now, instead of having one cow, mm -hmm. they have a couple of milk cows, and they have multiple head of cattle. I want to cattle. say like close to 20 cow, cattle. Yeah, 20 cattle, 30, something, like that. something this, like that. It's a fair number. Yeah. That's a whole new level of homesteading. Well, I'm not going to call that homesteading anymore. That's farming. I would call it farming. I mean, there's, 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 homesteading is such a weird word. It's, it's this... It's this it's held up as some sort of a wonderful thing. And it kind of annoys me because they're, they're a farm. That's what they are. They are now. They were a homestead in their first incarnations. When but I was they were still a small farm. Yeah, they, were, they were doing subsistence farming for themselves right. while they were still able to make money elsewhere. Yeah, but by, even at the first place that they had, they were already were going to the farmer's market and selling plants as a supplementary income. So let's, uh, I, I have a perspective on new homesteads and, and reasons to change it. 
which has to do with our place here. Mm -hmm. I'd never considered this or conceived of this as being a full-time homestead. No, it wasn't supposed to be. This was supposed to be a place where we could mark some time, we'd be able to do a few things for some years, mm -hmm. and we would decide to move on to a next place. Mm -hmm. Some place where there was water, better water, trees, trees, uh, more natural resources. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of reasons, mostly doing with my car accident and an unfortunate incident with a former employer a number of years ago, we ended up not being able to move on. Mm -hmm. What do we do now? We're stuck. Unless we could have enough money to be able to own, to, well, enough, enough money to be able to start doing another location at the same time. You know, you watch people when they are going to be moving, they usually, like the people in Missouri, were lucky enough to find a place literally down the street. They'd been talking to the neighbors, they were aware that- For the, years. For years. years. Uh, that they had been, they had known the neighbors, they had gotten to know them, and, and the family wanted to, the family down the street wanted this piece of property to stay as a farm. They didn't want it to be developed and plowed down and turned into a subdivision, which I'm sure is a problem in their area, just as it is every place else. And so they said, well, gee, we think we'd like to buy this piece of property. And they were able to cut some sort of a deal it was definitely the kind of a place that could be financed if they needed to because it had a well, it had electrical hookup, it had a not great but livable house, oh, right? and it had a barn, and it had some other out, small outbuildings. So from the perspective of a bank, it's a legitimate piece of property that, you know, so I don't know whether they financed it or not. They did not ever talk about that, I recall. It's none of our business, to be honest. But the fact is, they were able to find this place that they could afford, and they immediately started doing things over there. There's a deal, a long-standing deal, it sounds like, with one of the neighbors who mows the pastures and haze it, and haze it off, and that hay is put into the barn, which was in good enough shape to be able to be used as a hay barn. So now they have this huge resource. And we watched them, and I'm like, they're going to move there. And they weren't talking about moving it. And it's at obvious, all. Uh, very obvious. And very obvious to us that within, you know, like they started talking about it, and then the more, and more they started experimenting with gardening over there. They started putting in an orchard. They started, you know, and the next thing you know, they're moving. Well, one of the things that that building a new homestead or a new farm, new anything is you have to decide where you're going to live. Now, mm -hmm. this property had an um, existing house on it. It didn't suit their lifestyle. Right. So they made a different decision. So we have an opportunity to talk about alternative building me methods, ways to afford a home for mm -hmm. starting off homesteading. And I think we'll do those things in, in a future show. What do you right. think? You know, we looked at alternatives here, and we decided that uh, the knowledge base up here was just generally not good. You know, when we moved here, there were a lot of landowners that were um, financing property. You very rarely see that anymore because it's a pain in the butt. If the person who doesn't pay their bail, you have to go to court and take it back. So I guess we have a whole bunch of topics for future <laughs> shows. One is financing <laughs> a, a raw land for, for right. a full up new homestead. Mm -hmm. Another one is uh, housing alternatives and alternative right. construction and ways to make money on your homestead. Yep, yep, so that's we a have, big one. So we have a lot of things we can talk about. You know what I think today? Mm. I think we're going to say goodbye, friends. <laughs> we need to get back to work. I've got a list, you know, my usual list. And you have one, too. So uh, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Yeah, I'm, I caught his tongue disease there. Uh, because obviously we're going to be doing lots more. Uh, we have all kinds of gardening and things that we need to get to. We just canned up our turkey broth the other day. And uh, I need to, it's, it's cooling in the corner of the kitchen, but I need to redistribute some stuff in the pantry in order to sneak it in there, which is a per perennial problem for everyone. You, you see entire programs just on how to smoosh your pantry around and, and control things. And I have to label everything. 
because one of the things that we do anytime we bring anything into the pantry, including canned goods from the grocery store, is I take a magic marker and in the large letters on the front of that thing, it says that expiration date. So, so say the, goodbye, Irene. It's not too old that way. So until next time, bye. bye. And don't forget to brainstorm. Yeah, no matter where you are, whether you're in an apartment, a condo, uh, you know, anywhere, you need to brainstorm. It's good stuff. Use your brain. <laughs>